Good morning, Hathor to Sabli. It's a joy to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Welcome to Hawthorne Assembly. It's great to have each and every one of you here this morning, last Sunday of August. But what does that matter, huh? And uh, we're just glad you're here. We're glad that uh, we have another day of life and breath. We're glad that today is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it, right? And so you have the freedom here in America. You have the freedom in Wisconsin. You have the freedom in Douglas County. Let's keep going down. Let's, you have the freedom in, uh, well, I guess I'm not going down, Northwest Wisconsin, Douglas County, 
We're technically in Hawthorne, Wisconsin. Although we're not just Hawthorne Assembly of God, we are Solon Springs, we're Poplar, Maple, South Range, Bennett. You just keep clicking them off. Even Lake DeBagaman, that's a pretty important town. <laughs> and you have the freedom as a son or daughter of the living God to worship God in spirit and in truth today. Nothing's holding you back. There's no law that says you can't raise your hand. There's no law that says you can't shout amen, okay? So there's nothing holding you back except for one thing. You know what that is? You. That's it. So you worship God in spirit and truth however you want to worship him today. But give him your very best, would you please? If that's just tapping your toe, then tap your toe with all your might today. Shout to God with a voice of defeat. No. Oh, oh don't try him. Sorry. Amen. So we're supposed to be verbal, responsive, excited, over the top, sometimes crazy people because of our God. He's outstanding. Amen. Lord, we thank you today. We want to worship you in spirit and truth because a, the true worshiper worships you that way today. And we're opening our hearts today to worship you. We're opening even for those who are watching online today, that wherever they may be in their bedroom, their living room, wherever they're watching us today, God, they're going to worship you, you in spirit and in truth. And we're just thankful today that we have the freedom most of all, we have the freedom in Christ who has set us free. And we are going to do our very best today. Not out of coercion, not out of uh, being trying to be uh, guilt-tripped, but God, we're doing it because we love you. We love you with all our heart. And we're going to respond accordingly today now in your name. And all God's people said amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord.
let's maintain an attitude of openness and worship this morning as we draw our hearts towards Holy Communion, the Lord's table. You may be seated at this minute. Lord, we just open our hearts this morning to Holy Communion. We are gathered here in this place. And Holy Spirit, allow, we allow our, we open our hearts to receive from you, to, for your lamp light to search us. As David said, search me, God. And so today we open ourselves up. Wide open, God. For your spirit to search our hearts. Even as David said, create in me a clean heart, O Lord. And renew a right spirit. Yes, Lord, we just pray that today, that would be our prayer. Today, that would be our cry. As we prepare for this ordinance of the church today, as we, as you told us, as, as off as we do it, as often as we do it, we do it in remembrance of you. We proclaim your death, but not only your death, your resurrection, your power over death, hell, and the grave, and your soon return. Prophetically, we declare that, God, even as we take communion this morning, you're returning. Your return is soon. And God, we're grateful that we can gather with this group of people this morning and we can share at the Lord's table. Now, the instructions the words give us, the word gives us is that we should allow the Spirit of God to search our hearts right now before we take of the bread and we take of the juice his, that represent his body and blood, correct? And so you don't have to be a member of Hawthorne Assembly. You don't have to be a member of the Assemblies of God. You don't even have to live in this area. You just have to be part of the kingdom of God. Amen. You have to be a follower of Jesus. That's such a refreshing thing to know that you don't have to live up to some kind of perfect level. You don't have to have had a great week, a month or week ahead of, prior to this. You come here and you allow the Spirit of God to search your heart and you get things right with God right now, even at this very minute. Maybe you had a spat this week with your spouse. Maybe you were short with someone. Maybe you used some words you regret you used. Maybe you were uh, uh, angry at someone and unnecessarily angry. And so that right now, just take a moment and just say, Lord, I want to be at peace with you first and foremost, right? Got to be at peace with God, right? And I want to be at peace with everybody else. I don't want there to be any ill will in my heart. I don't want there to be any contempt for anyone. I don't want to have any bad attitude towards anyone, especially your family, your children, your spouse, right? So if the four men they are going to help me serve this morning would come up at this time. Allow this time while Brandy continues to play the music to just let the lamplight of the Spirit of God search your heart right now. Amen.
maybe serve communion that has not been served communion. So what you hold in your hands are the symbols, the epitome of love and sacrifice. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for a friend. And what a friend we have in Jesus, amen? All our sins and griefs to bear. And as I shared just a few weeks ago, it was your sin that put him on the cross. We look at other people and say, oh, yeah, those are sinners. No, it was, it was my sin. It was Joe Dawkins' sin. It was Joe Dawkins' sin this last week. I failed. Anyone else? You don't have to raise your hand, but just maybe nod your head. Did you fail this week? I failed miserably this week. Miserably. Not a good example of a man of God at all. Short with my siblings. Short with people. Just frustrated. Rolled my eyes at my wife. You know, just things you shouldn't do. And uh, Lord, we just are grateful today that if we confess our faults, that you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, you've called us to walk in a new way, in a holy way, in an upright and righteous way. God, you've called us to flee from sin. You say to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So God, we do that today. We, this week ahead of us now, we recommit ourselves to serving you so faithfully. We recommit ourselves to, to the walk that we know is ours as a follower of you. We are eternally grateful that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you're here this morning and you're taking communion, that means you know Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord. Because the Scripture says not to take this if you don't know Jesus as your Savior. And if you don't, sir, ma'am, whoever, if you're out there and you're about ready to take these elements, you surrender your life right now. Do it right now. Say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. I've never said it, but I'm saying it right now. I'm believing it. I'm receiving it. I know that I cannot make it to heaven by my good works. I need what you only, only what you did on the cross, Jesus, for my salvation. And so I thank you today. So as grateful followers of the Lord Jesus, as we hold this wafer that represents your broken body, and this cup of grape juice that represents your shed blood. These symbols have great power and great effect on our life today as we receive them by faith, by faith. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take eat, this is my body. Here we are today thousands of years later, doing the same thing. Let us take and eat of his body. gathered in an upper room a room that was prepared for them they had a meal they had shared a meal together and there was symbolism throughout the evening and the third cup that they shared together when it was lifted up and Jesus blessed it it became something new and more powerful and more permanent. It was that third cup that he said, now, this cup now represents what he would do on the cross. The shedding of his blood for the permanent forgiveness of our sins. 
with the blood of bulls and goats and pigeons and everything else they did ceremonially in the Old Testament that was only temporary fix would now be permanent. Amen. Permanent. As grateful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, our soon coming King, let us take up this cup that represents his shed blood. Can you, in your own way, just thank him for what he's done for you? Thank him. You know, he healed a bunch of lepers, but only one, only one came back and thanked him. Let's not be like those others that walked away just, well, we did it. We had communion again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you looked beyond my faults and you saw my need. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand again, and I think we have another worship song this morning. Let's pray as we receive the Lord's tithe. Father God, thank you for the tithe that belongs to you and the offerings that we give above the tithe. Bless now the gift and giver in your name. Amen. God bless you as you give. All right. Stand with me this morning. James chapter 1, verse 27. We honor the word of God. You're not, on, you're not I don't want you to stand just because I say stand. You're standing because we're honoring the word of God Today's sermon is how to get the attention of God. How to get the attention of God. This is not new. 
Pastor Tommy Barnett preached a mes- message similar to this over 20, actually over 30 years ago now. And uh, I spent time this weekend writing a new sermon based on some new thoughts using some of the old main foundational points, but it's fresh for you today, how to get the attention of God. James 127 says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Are you ready? To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And today, may your word jump alive off the pages of our Bibles or our electronic devices. May we want to highlight these verses. May your spirit speak to us, even things that Pastor Joe doesn't say, things that you, you just download in people's hearts today now in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, back in 1994, for 10 years, Janet and I attended the Pastor and Leaders School held in Phoenix, Arizona. Since we have people who are newer, the Pastors and Leaders School happens every February in Phoenix, Arizona. And we were pastors in Southeast Minnesota in February. All of you who are from Northwest Wisconsin know what February is like and know what it's like in Phoenix, Arizona in February. It's wonderful. It's the smartest time in the world to go to a pastors and leaders school and to escape winter and Not that we would add that to our agenda, but it goes on still. It's got a new name. I think it's called the Dream Conference now, but it happens in February. If you ever wanted to go, come talk to me, and I would encourage you. It's his son. Now, Pastor Tommy still preaches there. Uh, He's not the senior pastor anymore. He's the pastor emeritus. Uh, But he's, he's 85, and he's on fire for Jesus, and I just love it, and he changed my life. And I'm appreciative for Pastor Tommy. A lot of the things that I do were based on going for 10 years straight to that school. We were in Wilmer, Minnesota. I was in Wilmer, Minnesota just a day ago uh, doing some things for my folks. My dad's 88th birthday was on Wednesday. I couldn't be there for that, so I went on Friday, came back yesterday. We celebrated at the nursing home, 88 years of age. But we went to Frida's Cafe. Oh, Scott, you've been to Frida's Cafe. Kim's been to Frida's Cafe, a few others. Gene's been to Frida's. Paul's been to Frida's. Oh, yeah, Brad. You've all been. It's a little hole in the wall, but there was a gal in there on uh, her last day of work, and she said, I'm going back to Phoenix, Arizona, to Grand Canyon University for school. And I said, oh, I just love Phoenix, Arizona, especially in February. She goes, it's 25 hours to drive there. I go, I know, I've done it before. So if you're gonna drive, you're committed. You're fully committed. That's why I said all that to tell you that. It's a 25 hour drive. Well, where's our truck drivers? You've probably done it, right? It's a good solid two days, right? Oh, not for them, look at them. Oh, 20, oh, one hour less, okay. (laughs) Um, Back in 1994, Pastor Tommy read this passage. Let's read this passage. It will help bring a little more robustness to our passage that we read while we stood. So just go back a few verses to verse 22. Verse 22, let's start right there. Don't or do not, my version actually says do not, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Verse 25. But the man 
or woman, may I add that right here, who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he or she will be blessed in what they do. Amen? 26, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Strong word, worthless. Don't even have to interpret that for you, do I? Worthless. And we, as we read earlier, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now the next time we have a missions trip to Tijuana, this, these verses will have great impact, even greater impact upon your life because you'll go work with orphans. You'll go work with widows. We have a lot of widows in this church. We can do even more to minister to the widows of this church and be a blessing to them. Sometimes we just kind of assume that's just part of life. You know what I'm saying? What's well, part of life? People live, they get married. When my son Aaron was very small, I know that's hard to imagine. He's 6'4". He used to yell my name out loud. Daddy! 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 Over and over. Because he was trying to get my attention. Now my daughter, Lauren... On the other hand, she was very creative, and she never hollered to get my attention. The way she got my attention was the things that she made. She was super creative. Uh, she would help with less fortunate people, and I'd see her, or she'd kind of tell me, or she'd make things or draw things that reflected helping the poor, helping orphans, helping people who were in hard ways, and it got my attention. She wanted, she wanted to rescue animals. You, see, you get what I'm saying? Often, if she heard about somebody that was hurting, you know what? She'd just start crying, like, right now. Can any of you relate to what I'm talking about? Like, when you hear about other people hurting, it just breaks your heart? And that's the way, that's the way Lauren was, and it got my attention! And I was so tender towards her. That's the way our Heavenly Father is. And the reason he is that way is because he cares about orphans and widows. Now, that's not the only people he cares about, but he absolutely, clearly articulated this to us in his word, that if we want to get his attention, because go back to our main verse, it says, religion that God our Father accepts. In other words, it gets his attention. What are they doing? Whoa, they're finally listening to what I've told them to do. Sometimes we're slow, aren't we? As my buddy would say, Joe, you're slow, but you're worth it. That's, I think, how God thinks about us sometimes. You're slow. We're slow, but we're worth it. He paid a steep price to redeem us. Amen. And we, we need to do whatever we can while we have life and breath to fulfill the calling he's placed upon our life. And you don't even have to be called into the full-time ministry to help orphans and widows or people who are in distress. It says here, if, and it also in our passage this morning, we realize there's a few more things added to it. But my, my attention today is drawn to the things that we can do here in northwest Wisconsin to get the attention of God. There's another great passage in the Word of God. Let's turn there this morning. Let's turn to Mark chapter 2. Turn with me, please. Verses 2 through 5. So, I would just encourage you to begin to pray, God, what do you want me to do about orphans? Because it's something that we all should be somehow involved. There are orphans now in Maui, Hawaii. Hello? Did you know that 
until just a couple days ago, you know how many people were missing? A thousand. They just updated it. I believe it's below 400 now. I had, that's just a couple days ago. Maybe it's already gone down more. Let's pray it keeps going down. But that means there's at least 100 they know of for sure. Somewhere between 100 and in the north of 300 people that have probably slipped into eternity. Which means there's orphans. Which means there's widows. Which means when you gave that money a couple days ago, guess what you did? You fulfilled this passage. Because we sent it immediately through Convoy of Hope to Maui, Hawaii. And we're helping them with water. I mean, water is a fulfillment of, of, of the blessing of the Lord, right? When you give a cold cup of water. Let me tell you, this is important that we are a charitable, loving, giving ministry here in Northwest Wisconsin. That's why we, I just thinking about it, I gotta make sure that we have enough wood for this winter. Winter's coming whether we want it to or not. And that wood out there, we need to remind people, you need wood, there's wood for free in our parking lot. And we're gonna make sure that our plow guy, we know last year was the a winter tsunami, wasn't it? My goodness, we had so much snow in the parking lot, we didn't know where to put it. Uh, so this year we're gonna be a little more proactive. We're going to push it way down the hill and we're going to get it out of the way. Plus we've got a pavilion we want to build this winter. So we got to definitely keep it. You come over with your trucks. We'll just dump it in the back of your trucks. Okay. The snow, and you can take it away. No, just, we're not going to do that. Mark chapter two, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there that, that so meant so many gathered there that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Verse 3, some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Verse 4, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. That is a perfect example of giving it everything we can to get the attention of God. Those four men got the attention of God, didn't they? And sometimes it takes an effort beyond just normal reasoning. I mean, who would think about digging open somebody's roof and saying, we're going to dig open this person's roof, we're going to make, create a mess, we're going to create a commotion, but we're going to get this guy to Jesus. I was watching the Chosen uh, movies and whatever you want to call them, and it was the one about the woman with the issue of blood, and I know I've shared about it before, but I'm just going to tell you, her effort is what got the attention of God because it ultimately wrapped up itself in the fact that she touched but the hem of his garment, right? This is how we get the attention of God. We go the extra mile. We go the extra effort. We do the unconventional. We do things to get God's attention because we care about people. If we want to be a soul-winning church, he who wins souls is wise, we need to have the attention of God and the presence of God and the blessing of God. And if he knows our heart is towards the orphan, if he knows that our heart is towards the widow, if he knows that our heart is towards the paralytic, the lame, the hurting, the downtrodden, I'll tell you what, God will honor every single one of you that calls. I'm just going to throw it out there. I'm giving you life lessons. You want to say, well, you know, Pastor, can you teach us something? Call Doris Stensland this week and tell her you're praying for her. There you go. You want to know how to get the attention of God? Do that. Just allow the Spirit of God to speak to your heart this week about who you can minister to. You'll get the attention of God. Not, look, it's not like, look at me, I'm being a Christian, but don't you want the blessing of the Lord? Don't you want the anointing of God? Don't you want the covering of God? The angels of the Lord encamp around those who fear him and also, may I add, do his will. I remember when Elizabeth Pascuzzi came to our church and she looked right at me and said, Pastor Joe, you are immortal until God calls you home 
if you're doing God's will for your life. I went, I'm, glad, I'm grabbing hold of that. I'm grabbing hold of that. I'm immortal until God calls me home if I'm doing his will. Okay. If you're walking out of his will, we've heard lots of horror stories. We don't even have time today to talk about it. But Pastor Tommy in his sermon, as he's talking about getting the attention of God, he gives a name to these four gentlemen the Bible talks about because their names are not recorded. So stick with me. It's just a good idea. He says their names are Brother Love, Brother Hope, Brother Faith, and Brother Will. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Each one of these guys was working together in unity to get the attention of God, to get the attention of Jesus. And one of them, maybe his calling was he was a a lover of souls. And he just loved people. He just loved people like you can't even imagine because Jesus had changed his life. And the other was Brother Hope who knew if we could just get him there, God's going to do something. If we could just get him there. And Brother Faith knew that Jesus was the healer. He knew. He had the faith to know that there's nothing that stops Jesus from touching this man. And Brother Will, he was so determined, he said, you know what, this is God's will for our life. We are the four guys, we are gonna get up on that roof, we're gonna make a commotion, but something's gonna happen, because we know this man needs a touch from God, amen? (coughs) Excuse me. These four guys had the full attention of God because they cared about this sick person. When you care for sick people, you get the attention of God. When you're loving on people, you see, it's a, I find pleasure. I'm gonna say it again. I repeat things often, but they're important. That's why I repeat them. Because I don't think you've all figured it out yet. I haven't figured it all out yet either, amen? That's why I find great pleasure in serving my mom and dad who are broken vessels. I was with them for their, my Dad's 88th birthday, and guess what? He asked me at least 25 times in the three hours that I was with him, where are we? Do you know that starts to grate on you? And it starts to wear on you? And you you sometimes want to get exasperated, but I go, "Mm mm-mm. No, the fifth commandment says, Honor thy father. I have, to, I have to remind myself. I do. But God does something. Something takes over. And the grace of God kicks in. And the mercy of God kicks in. And the, and the peace that passes all understanding kicks in. And I do not break apart. Now, I, I'm, I want to break apart. Do you understand the difference? I've lost it a couple times. I've had to walk out of the room because it's going to lose it because I'm human. And dealing with sick people, I just want to thank God if you're a nurse or you work in the healing arts or whatever you want to call that, oh, God bless you because you deal with people and they can be difficult. God bless you for what you do, amen? Because you're ministering the grace of God, the love of God. And so these four guys, they're... Their their actions were sincere, and yet they were strategic, and that's what we want to be. We want to be sincere and strategic. That's good points to write down, that you want to be sincere and strategic. You don't just want to be sloppy, agape, just feel bad, and your heart goes out for every single cause, because we can't help every single cause here. We can't help every time Convoy of Hope goes somewhere across the planet. We can't. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We have to be sincere and we have to be strategic. In other words, we say, okay, Lord, are you calling us to help here? Well, he's told us clearly where to help. Orphans and widows that are right here in our neck of the woods. We should be helping the orphans and widows around here before we even think about helping them even in Tijuana, Mexico. Hello? I'm helping you here. I'm helping you to understand kingdom principles. It says do good first to the what? The household of faith. So God bless 
Sandra, we want to pray for her. Let's pray right now. Has the door opened back up for ministry in the prison? Okay. But see, we want to minister to hurting people. Sandra has a calling and a gift. She's just good at that. I remember when I first came here, I thought I'm a pretty good youth pastor. I was a pretty good youth pastor. I had a youth group at Grand Junction of about 40 to 50 kids. You know, and I came here and I remember I tried to have an event and like two people showed up and Sandra said, Pastor, we'll have a hayride. We'll do this. I kid you not, there's like 27 kids that showed up. Because it wasn't, it's just, she's called to do those kind of things. So we want to pray that every one of you fulfills the calling God has on your life, whether it's mugs and muffins, whatever it might be, worship team. God was wired you, but ultimately, we want to minister to the hurting. Uh, Pastor Barnett has a church of 10,000 plus. It's a huge building. It's just cool to sit in there. I'm not, I'm not in love with the building. It's just cool that it's something for the kingdom of God. Do you get what I'm saying? Oh, you just like the fact that it's just big. No, I just, it's just cool. Do you know what it's going to be like in heaven? The Bible says it's going to be, you can't even count the number of people that are going to be there of all colors and creeds and races. It's going to be, it's going to be unbelievable. And so... We're there at this church, and, you know, he's just ministering to people. He, he's got the developmentally disabled on stage, and he's bragging about them. He's got people in wheelchairs on the stage, and he's bragging about them. Now, I know sometimes that's, we struggle with that as some of the God people, because they're thinking, hey, we're supposed to be seeing everybody healed. But for some reason, and I can't figure it out yet, and I pray for everyone to be healed instantaneously, but they don't. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep anointing with oil. But there are people, for some reason, they're still in wheelchairs. They still have crutches. They still have sickness, and they still die. And he loves on these people, and he ministers to them until they breathe their last breath. And he says, you know why our church is so blessed? He goes, do you know why? I was just telling someone this the other day. He goes, you know why our church has so many wealthy people who sit in here? Because they see us ministering to the hurting and they say they're doing it they are making a difference and we do have a world where we have people who are way more financially blessed than the average person right i was just talking to this about my son i said tim i don't know why i said okay i'm just being super transparent i have never in my life there was one season in my life where i made I've never made over $100,000 a year. I've never made over $80,000 a year. I've never made over $70,000 a year. I made maybe close to $60,000 one year in Minnesota when I was working a secular job and I was part-time at a church. That was it. And I said, Tim, all your friends, all their parents were all millionaires. I kid you not. They were all millionaires. But I'm okay because my calling wasn't to get rich. My calling was to preach the gospel. And I'm okay, I'm at peace with that. Because my ultimate reward is gonna be standing before the Lord and hear him say, well done, the good and faithful servant. But I want rich people to come here to Hawthorne Assembly. I do, so they can support ministry. The poor you'll always have with you, Jesus said. Is is there something wrong with my prayer that rich people come here? Is there anything wrong with that? No way. So if they see us ministering to orphans and widows and the hurting, they're going to say, oh yeah, we're giving to that church. They're, They're the real deal. They're ministering to the people that Jesus says we need to minister to at highest priority. Now, everyone deserves ministry. Everyone deserves the love of God. Everyone deserves uh, counseling. Everyone deserves whatever is necessary in their growth and development as a follower of Jesus. 
But I promise you, if we will fulfill what these passages talk about with orphans, with widows. Oh, by the way, she's also just right over here, Doris. Used to be called Middle River. Now it's Aspen Health. There's no more COVID lockdown. Don't have to worry about that. You can go right in there. I think it's probably mask-free right now, isn't it? So, praise the Lord. No reason. That, that COVID season was a bugger, wasn't it? People got mad at me because I defied some of the COVID rules. I hope you all love me. Even though I was a little bit cantankerous about a couple of those things. Remember, we used to have the seats apart. We made you only sit in little pods with people. I'm not going to get on COVID, but I'm just saying, you know what? I'm going to be hugging till Jesus comes. Come another COVID-2, COVID-3, I don't give a rip. The world was led astray by that bugger, weren't they? Look at the messed up kids we have because of that, because they couldn't be with other kids. I'm, I'm getting on a bad bandwagon here. Okay, so we're going to move on. Back to... We're going to minister to orphans and to widows and the hurting. Amen? Until Jesus comes. Imagine if we had healing services here and three ambulances drove up here instead of to the hospital and said, would you pray for these people first? Because we've heard that you're ministering to the hurting. I've always said, like Aaron, when Aaron jumped off this chair and he broke his arm and he said, but dad, my arm is not broken, she's bent. I mean, it was going 90 degrees. I, st I started speaking in tongues and I commanded that thing to come back to be normal and it didn't come back and it wasn't, it was still going that way, the wrong way. And I, I said, let's get in the car, we're going to the hospital, okay? And we'll get the doctor to give you a little sleeping juice and they'll reset your arm and it's great you can't even tell that he broke his arm so the healing miracle just took place just not the way i was hoping it expected it to. when my brother had a seizure on my floor at my previous home in northfield minnesota uh and i just started speaking in tongues and commanded that whatever it was that was causing that and it stopped immediately i freaked out the rest of my family I'm the kind of guy who says, speak in tongues, pray at the top of your voice, command healing. If somebody's gasping for air, just don't freak them out. You know, use wisdom. Pray, command healing, and then if they're still hurting, throw them in the car and take them to the hospital, okay? But don't forget to pray. Don't forget to speak in tongues. Don't forget to let the Spirit of God move in your life, amen? That's how miracles take place. That's how things change. Can you imagine if we were the kind of place where people said, we're bringing our family. Oh, yeah, we're still going to go to the doctor. I remember my dad, he had a tumor in his head. Massive. It was causing him to slur his speech. And he was leaning sideways and, you know, wobbling when he walked and found out this tumor was pressing down. And the Indian doctor said, the gal said, Mr. Dokken, uh, your father's uh, brain is not good. It, uh, it, you know, and so she said it's he's probably gonna maybe lose his ability to talk might lose his ability to walk properly and we prayed he came down to the front of the wilmer assembly of god church and we anointed him with oil and we prayed the prayer of faith and i was praying in tongues and commanding the, that thing to shrink up and to die he still went and had surgery but guess what when they went and did surgery and some of you've heard this they opened him up they take this saline solution and they irrigate it's called before they actually cut and they were irrigating, and the thing fell out. The tumor fell out. And they decided still to cut the margins, they said, just to be careful. And when he woke up, they said, Mr. Dawkins, how are you doing? He went just like this. <laughs> I believe God was going to shrink that tumor and... But it, my dad needed that for whatever reason. Maybe I needed that for whatever reason to know it was happening. Maybe you're here right now and you got a cranking headache. 
I'm believing for God to touch your headache right now. I'm believing that we are going to be a place where healings and miracles happen. People who are hurting find hope. Orphans find hope. Widows are cared for and loved on. Remember what? There was a moment in the church, the New Testament church, where there was some commotion and there was some anger. And you know what was over? Certain widows weren't getting, were not getting taken care of. And do you know what happened because of that, that issue? If you think that isn't important, what, did, what happened because of that one issue? Come on, Bible scholars, what happened? They started deacons because of that one issue. That was the original reason, not so you could count the money at the church. Deacons were started to help out with widows so that the men of God could pray and do the work of the ministry. Hello? You want to get the attention of God? Serve these people. Luke 14, 23. Let's kind of wrap this up this morning. It's already high noon. Luke 14, 23. You want to get the attention of God? Minister to the people God cares about. Not that he doesn't care about you, but he probably cares that you would care about the people who are less fortunate than you. I look across this congregation and I, I see a lot of blessed people. Amen. Luke 14, 23 says, Then the master told his servants, Go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house might be full. One version says, Compel them to come in. Church, until Jesus returns, this is kind of our agenda, is to get the orphans, the widows, minister to them, love on them, invite them to our church, invite those who are hurting, the sick, the lonely, that those who are really hurting and in a tough way in life, amen, they're all over this part of, Min of Wisconsin, excuse me, and northern Minnesota. Lord, I pray that our church would have impactful connections with people all around northwest Wisconsin and even Minnesota. I pray for people, God, who you want to draw here, who can be influential in areas where there are hurting people, God, hurting people, orphans, widows, all kinds of things, God. Lord, you touch the physically sick, the spiritually sick, the demon-possessed, the Samaritan, the hungry, the woman with the issue of blood, and so much more. And God, I believe as we minister to these people that we have record of these scriptures that you tell us about, that God, we're going to get your attention. You're going to anoint this church with even greater things. Healings that flow. Blessings that flow. Being able to help people who are hurting financially and so much more. As your word says, if a man shuts his ear to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. Did you hear that? I'll say it again. Proverbs 21, 13. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he will cry out and not be, he too will cry out and not be answered. Lord, help us to do the things we need to do as a church to get your attention. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to gather here. We thank you for the people that came and are listening to the word, thinking about how it affects their life, thinking about how they can get your attention in even greater ways with the life you've given them, the calling you've placed on their life. There are some of you in here today, God's knocking on the door of your heart. Maybe you know that you need to start a ministry in greater ways to widows. You need to start a ministry to people who are hurting, the down and outers. He said, let Hawthorne Assembly, we want to do our part through the lives of people who call this their church home. So God, thank you for that. Thank you for the things we'll do to minister even as we clean the ditch this fall. Whatever we do to minister the grace of God to our community, we want to do it, Lord. We want to do it to the very best, God. God, we know that when we do these things that we get your attention. And we know that your protection goes with us. Your anointing goes with us. 
your grace goes with us. Your blessing goes with us. Your prosperity goes with us. Ministry follows faith, not the other way around. Ministry, money follows wherever ministry goes. It's not the other way around. Oh, we gotta be wise. We don't build weird things and spend all kind of money just because we think it might do something. But we, op, we step out in faith and we do ministry and God blesses it. And so we're thankful, God, today for your attention in these areas. And if you're here today and you need to repent because you've, you've, uh, you've ignored these cries of the, of the hurting and you can do something about it, you need to repent. I'm not asking you to maybe be that one-on-one -on -one person, but maybe you're supposed to put $100 into the benevolence fund for orphans in Maui. Maybe you're supposed to put $500 into a benevolence fund to help with widows who need their cars fixed at Hawthorne Assembly. Hello, are you hearing me today? These are the things we can do. And we just thank you for that, Lord, in your name. Amen. Stand with me this morning. We've got one last song. Thanks for staying here. The altars are open. You come if you have any need. I'd love to pray with you.
will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Help us to get your attention in the ways your word tells us to. That your eyes are drawn towards us as we're doing what you've called us to do. I just sense that there was someone today, and I just prayed with a couple other people, of course, but sensed even as I looked down at the communion today that I was supposed to remind someone that when you took communion today not only does it prophetically say the the Lord's return but when you take that bread that by his stripes you were healed are being healed it is something that you can claim for your life right now for healing in your body I believe there's someone that if you'll just meditate upon that that God's going to touch you uh, because you sense that there is by faith there is provision for healing as we receive it through communion and we recognize it that it's by his stripes that we're healed 39 times one less than death he was whipped for your healing receive it today Lord I pray for that person today because they took communion and they are needing healing in their body. I don't know what it is, but I just sense it strongly today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you this morning.